All right, welcome to TYT Interviews. We've got a great interview for you guys today. Peter Melman, he is a writer, an author, a producer, uh, worked on a little show called Seinfeld, uh, which I certainly want to ask him about. And his uh, book is It Won't Always Be This Great. Peter, great to have you here. Pleasure to be here. All it's right. It's been months since I've been in Culver City. <laughs> Good to have you back. So, on behalf of Culver City, um, <laughs> so I want to talk about the book in a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about your career and uh, and definitely uh, Seinfeld, obviously. So, first of all, you didn't start out as a TV writer. You started out uh, writing about sports for the Washington Post. Yes. Right. So, how did you get that job? That sounds like a pretty cool job to get. That was a great place. job, and you wouldn't believe how I got how I got it. Um, I heard at the time that they weren't hiring any white males at the Washington Post. Really? And um, yeah, this was a, this was a, a scoop I got. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I actually wrote a job letter to Howard Simons, who was played by Martin Balsam in All the President's Men. Uh -huh. I actually wrote a job letter to the managing editor as a woman. Really? And it was a really funny job letter. And I wrote it as a woman, and they liked the letter so much that now this is 1979, so they wrote me back mm -hmm. saying, we have a job opening we could give to you. It's got terrible hours, mm -hmm. but you can have it just because we enjoyed your letter so much. Mm -hmm. Well, then I was a little stuck because they were expecting me to be a woman named Faith Michelle Cates. Uh -huh. So then I wrote another letter, enclosed the first letter, and explained why I wrote the first letter as a woman. And then they were just like, they, I got to meet every editor in the building. Oh, wow. They so instead of getting in. mad, they loved it. They loved it. Huh. So what you know, you Washington, D.C. is not a place where they're used to any kind of humor at all. So mm -hmm. they were really kind of blown away by humor. It's the unfunniest place in the, pl in the world. Not the Washington Post per se, but Washington, D.C., if you listen to NPR, Every time one of the anchors or something like that tries to make a joke, I mean, you know, you cringe. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. I mean, they think Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is like Mel Brooks and Woody Allen combined into one thing, and, you know, and Richard Pryor all in one. I mean, <laughs> and it's the unfunny. You know, I don't have to say. <laughs> okay, it's all right. You can say it, man. Uh, so, yeah, I know. I lived in Washington three years, too. Yeah, it's, it's painful over there. So, uh, I like that they appreciated that. Uh, were you, did you, uh, do it just as a prank? Did you do it like as an anti-affirmative action thing? What did you? No, I did it to get a job. <laughs> right, you that's know? true. Right? I did it to get in, to yeah. get it, to get my foot in the door. So did they? Give Obviously, you I didn't plan it out that well. <laughs> and well, it worked out. It well worked, enough. but you know, you know, I probably should have anticipated that it might become a problem when they realize I'm a man. But okay. So what they gave you the sports job from that? I got. My foot in the door at the sports department, I was partially a copy aide, and then I, I was such a bad copy aide, which, you know, like I would, you know, people would be calling in a story from India, and I'd, ha I'd put them on hold and then hang up on them. Right. I was so bad at that stuff that they actually just started letting me write, <laughs> which is really it's, what I wanted to do. It's like a, a friend of mine who now works here. Uh, whenever we played football, we'd switch positions, but he didn't like playing offensive line. He liked playing quarterback, so they, he just let anybody come on in and tackle the quarterback until we had to switch him to quarterback. Right, <laughs> so, fail up. <laughs> but it worked well for you because you were meant to be a writer, obviously. I mean, look, uh, what, some of the lines that he came up with are uh, things you might remember, like yada yada yada, uh, and and I, that one sticks out of my head, Peter, because I say it pretty much ever since that that episode. I've mm -hmm. been saying it as well as. I mean, God knows how many people, millions of people. That's how, does that feel really good to to write something that became part of the lexicon? It feels good, but I keep thinking that it should feel better because I get that question a lot, and I'm thinking maybe I'm not feeling as great about this as I should. I mean, I thought I was feeling pretty good about it, <laughs> but you know, like I was thinking. God, maybe I should be like waking up every day and just being like exultant about this. Well, that's funny. You're not the only one to say that. Maybe it's just the human condition. I recently interviewed Norman Lear, and I mean, the guy's a living legend, mm. right? I mean, every day he should wake up and be like, yes, like I nailed it. I nailed life, right? And he's like, nah, I wake up a little stressed about the next speech I'm going to give. And 
<laughs> yeah. So I guess that's how we all are. I really thought resting on my laurels would be something I'd be good at, but I'm not. <laughs> so so uh, you work with Howard Cosell. I'm going to come back to Seinfeld in a second. You work with Howard Cosell. Uh, how is that? I mean, w w he's a, certainly an interesting character. From the outside, I don't know anything about him. It, it seemed that he had some drinking issues. Uh, but that he might have been, a, although inappropriate, but a fun guy to be around. I loved him, and uh, it was an unbelievable two and a half years to be around him. And you know, you felt like you were in the center of the sports universe. It was really amazing, and he was tons of fun to be around. He had a great sense of humor. He was really, really funny. And um, you know, I always used to give Jerry all this. You know, I used to tell Seinfeld that. He's the second funniest boss I had. So I know some people that uh, worked with news anchors back in the day, right? And they were they were Ron Burgundy. I mean, they they I don't mean in the he'll read anything in the prompter, but like they drank a lot, they did cocaine, they did you know they did all this stuff. Like I guess maybe it's, it's almost like Mad Men, which we were talking about off air before. Like now, nobody like that's not true. I'm sure a lot of people drink and do cocaine, but I don't know them, right? It seems like things got a lot more professionalized, but like also more robotic. So back in the day, did I don't know? Am I, I don't know if you're allowed to say? Did Howard used to drink? Did he like? Did anybody care? He drank at lunch. He had a, you know he had a, a vodka or two, and but it never really hurt his performance. In fact, he would come back and. He would record his radio show in the afternoon, and if it were a minute and 59, he would be talking and go, oh, this is Howard Cosell at 1.59. I mean, his timing in his head was unbelievable. And, um, you know, he was really funny, and, you know, I mean, a couple extra drinks, he could get belligerent. Mm -hmm. But, you know. Yeah, it's human. Yeah, okay, so... How did you transition from sports to wind up being a TV comedy writer? How did you get to Seinfeld? Um, I was a freelance magazine writer after um, after working at ABC Sports, and um, you know, which is kind of like doing what I really thought I should be doing, which is writing full sentences. You know, um, and then um, you know, I was writing for GQ and the New York Times and all these women's magazines. And uh, I met Larry David in New York once or twice in the late 80s. And then in 1989, I moved out here. And then a year after I was out here, I bumped into Larry David. And he just told me that he's doing this little TV show with Jerry Seinfeld. Maybe he could write a script. I had never written a script. So what I gave him was an essay, which was kind of humorous and a little poignant, oddly enough. Uh, from the New York Times magazine, mm -hmm. and um, the offer was to give him a writing sample and he'd pass it on to Jerry, which several other people got too, and oddly enough, they all turned in scripts and Jerry wasn't that interested, and I turned in an article and uh, I got a shot. So it's just, you literally bumped into Larry David in the street? It's all luck. It's always all you, luck. So yeah, let's pause on that for a second. You think if that day you're not going for a burger on that street and you don't run into Larry David, is it possible you never work on Seinfeld, you never wind up doing all these things? It's possible. It's definitely possible. I mean, it's so funny, I got to say, you know, I never really thought of that and it is totally possible. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, of course, it could you could have still cuz you knew Larry David a little bit. It's possible mm -hmm. that they got started and then you talked to him and you wind up in there anyway. It's possible, but it's possible that it wouldn't have turned yeah. out that way. God, man, just that one day makes so much difference. Maybe all the difference. It's all about preparing yourself to get lucky. That's right. Cuz if you didn't have that article and they didn't love it, well, you wouldn't have gotten hired anyway, no matter right. how many times you bumped into him. Right. So um, once you start, they like the article. You they bring you in. You at that point you've never been a TV writer, so they say, okay, now okay, now get to it, Peter. Write an actual script. What do you do? Well, they gave me the three episodes that they had shot at that point, 
They had only done three episodes, and I got to watch them, and then they wanted me to come up with ideas and pitch them ideas. And I watched the three episodes, and I was kind of like blown away. I was thinking, oh my God, this is actually really good. I mean, you know, then I got a little nervous because I kind of wanted to be good at this. Mm -hmm. And I went in, and I pitched them the ideas, and um, Larry Charles, one of the other writers who was on the show before me and had known Larry forever, um, he was the only, the only other writer on the first three. He uh, helped my story idea along, and um, I got a chance to write a script. I mean, it was unlike any other show, which I later found out. I mean, you know, they just said, yeah, that's a good idea. Go ahead and write it. I had no George story. I had a Jerry and Elaine story, you know, about, about Jerry <clears throat> kind of mindlessly telling Elaine that there's a build an open apartment in his building and then realizing, oh my God, I'm going to have my ex-girlfriend living in the building. This is terrible. Right, right. And that's all I had. Nothing with Kramer, nothing with George, really. Mm -hmm. And they just sent me off to write. You know, every, any other show, they would like give you beat by beat by beat of the story and you'd basically be doing ad libs, you know, mad libs, just filling it in. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I had to write the whole script and I didn't really know what I was doing, which had a bit of an advantage to it because, you know, I just wrote very freely. So it, how does a, a normal TV show work as opposed to how Seinfeld worked? Because then later you wound up producing your own show for mm -hmm. ABC, right? Yes. And so uh, how, how was that process? Uh, well, on my own show, I... You know, I continued the Seinfeld process, which was, you know, all the writers were responsible for coming up with ideas for the show, pitching them to the executive producer, and going off and writing them on their own, as opposed to most shows where it's a whole group in a room, you know, what they call the writer's room, mm -hmm. and they're all writing together, and they're all sitting up and rewriting every night till three in the morning, mm -hmm. <coughs> and... Um, you know, I was never a fan of that system, and, you know, it wouldn't have worked for me. I'm not, like, somebody who can sit there shouting out jokes till 3 in the morning. I just can't do it. Yeah, I couldn't concentrate in a room like that. I'd have to go back and think about it and yeah. come up with an idea and things that work together and I mean, build you're just out. pitching joke after joke after joke. It's like being, like, a really overpaid Willie Loman. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's interesting, too. So... You go and write, let's go back to Seinfeld for a second. You go and write uh, the first copy of the script. And then what happens after that? I write it. I throw in a George story about him wearing a wedding ring to a New York marathon party. Mm -hmm. Larry and Jerry had no idea that these were going to be even in the show. Had no idea there would be a wedding ring story, no idea there would be a marathon party. But I had that ring idea somehow came to me about wearing a ring and thinking like maybe women would really hit on you if you're wearing a wedding I ring. I remember, I remember that episode, yeah. <laughs> and I just wrote it and, um, excuse me, I drove to the lot and I dropped it off with Larry and Jerry and they, Larry said, well, uh, we probably won't read it till uh, tomorrow or the next day, so we'll get back to you. And I made a few stops on my way back from the valley to where I lived in Venice. And by the time I got home, there was a message on my machine from Larry going, uh, we lied, we read it immediately, it was, uh, it's great, it's really fantastic, you're terrific. And, <laughs> and, you know, like I, at that moment, I really did have this strange feeling that my life was about to change radically. So how long did you work on Seinfeld, the whole duration? Pretty much. I wasn't. Th I was there from that point to. I wasn't there for the final season. So from three episodes in, all the way to uh, until the final season. Right. I wasn't on staff. The second season. There was three seas Three episodes. The first season. There were thirteen. The second. I wasn't on staff. The second. But I. My show was recorded in the second, and I went to every. Re taping and table read and everything. And then I was on staff for seasons three through eight. Three through eight, yeah. And then I 
left after season eight. So I, I'm not talking about the camera guys or anything like that, but in the people writing the show, putting the show together, how many people worked on it? Um, as far as the writing team yeah. stuff, it varied wildly. Um, the first year, there were about there were like four. They hired four new writers, and I was kind of the sole survivor of that season. They, um, and then the next year was kind of an experiment, and that was you know the really great year. That was season four, which was just an unbelievably great season. We they. They, Larry and Jerry hired four comedians to basically generate ideas. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that, you know, me and Larry David and Larry Charles basically wrote the whole season. And then the show just got so huge that the budgets went through the roof. And so, you know, the writing staffs got bigger. It got to be like 10 or 11 people. So in the beginning, as you guys are creating Comedy Gold, it's only, what, including Seinfeld and, and Larry David, six of you, four writers and, and those two guys. Right. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, th I, w I would thought you were going to say 20 people, you know? Uh, no. Yeah. No. Um, very few. Hmm. And then there's the producers who do, like, the nitty-gritty of putting the show together and doing the sets and yada, yada. See, there it is. Yeah. Well, doing, <laughs> I mean, you know, doing this, the producers and, you know, a lot of that stuff is just titles. Uh -huh. you know, there are the, ti there, they are the, there are the, like the producers who, you know, deal with all the money and make sure that all the sets are done and everything like that. But those, those, there are like four of those or three or four. So the writers are the heart of the show. That's, that's what it is. I mean, you're biased, obviously, you're right. Yeah, but. well, I mean, at Seinfeld, you know, the heart of the show is Larry David. So how much, I don't know if you're allowed to answer this, how much was Larry David, how much was Jerry Seinfeld? I would say, um, I, I would say probably 60, 40, Larry David. Okay. Yeah, all right, that makes sense. I mean, maybe that's... I think that's probably what I would have guessed from the outside. I mean, you know, you know Jerry has to act too. <laughs> right. So, you know, it's not like he can be writing nonstop also. So, right. you know, he wrote a lot with Larry, but then again, you know, Larry wrote a lot on his own. Yeah. No, you, and they're a great team, obviously. And you guys were all a great team. You all uh, did amazing work together because, you know, this is my BS opinion, but uh, in Curb Your Enthusiasm, you see Larry David without anyone reining him in, right? And so he's so over the top, right, that it almost makes you uncomfortable. Whereas, like with Seinfeld, somebody, I got the sense, was like, okay, that's good, that's good. Let's just dial it back like 10% so people don't riot, right? Yeah, but, you know, there's also the big difference of being on NBC yeah. in, in the 90s as opposed to being on HBO, you know. That's true too. In the 2000s. Yeah, that's a huge difference too. So speaking of which, I want to go jump back to your own show. So you weren't used to notes because on Seinfeld at that point, I guess they became powerful enough that they didn't have to deal with notes from the, from the TV executives. And I always hear about this. I guess I more than anything else, I've read about it. But I don't, I, this is the first time I'm talking to someone who actually got notes, right? Mm -hmm. So you write your script. Uh, you're the, the executive producer and the writer for the show, right? So w you hand it in to the executives. What do they do? I don't hand it in to them. I, we have a table read mm -hmm. where they come. and they, I mean, they've read the script. Mm -hmm. And they come to the table read and they hear. And then you sit around and they, they have objections, suggestions, outright complaints. It depends on what they got, you know. I bet, you know, I was very unused to that. You know, the very first time that I got a note, you know, they said it was like a little bit of a plot point thing. And I, you know, I opened the script and I go, uh, and I read it and I go, oh, I think it's pretty good the way it is. What else you got? Mm -hmm. And these people from ABC looked at me as if I would just spoken out in favor of incest. You know, I mean, it was <laughs> unbelievable. So, okay, that dynamic's interesting. First of all, who are they? Are they management? Are they 
in any way part of the content? Is do they who, who are they? Because and for people who don't know, table read is actors get around and they read the script, right? They're just reading it and going through right. so that people get a sense of what the show is going to be like, right? So and they happen to be sitting there and they then they write down things and they give, who are they? Um, I don't know. <laughs> they, do they have uh, they're titles? They're people, like vice president think, of being a pain I in the ass or they are people who want to be in the entertainment field. <laughs> um, you know, they they have unbelievable titles like the head of comedy, mm -hmm. senior vice president of comedy. <laughs> That's already funny. Yeah, like <laughs> you know, what do you do to qualify for that position? I have no idea. Do you have to take a comedy test? Do you have to like do five minutes of half decent stand up or something? No. So I don't exactly know. I, I think it's more like just the desire to be in the entertainment business. But it's weird because, you know, on the one hand, you know, the, the network people, they want to have some creative ownership mm -hmm. of the product. You know, they want to mm -hmm. feel like they're creatively involved. And, you know, on the other hand, you want to say to them, well, if you want to be creatively involved, maybe in being an executive was the wrong way to go. But so, you know, what's I, I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't want to. It's unseemly for me to, you know, be complaining about executives in the TV business because, you know, I've had a pretty good ride. Yeah, you know, I, I hear you. I hear, you, but we're just having a honest yeah. conversation. So, um, are there notes? What? Is it supposed to be about the content or is it supposed to say, hey, like, oh no, that might have a legal issue or that might have an issue with being on in prime time in ABC? The, well, there are different departments in that. There's definitely a legal, every script is vetted for possible legal problems, which is funny because, you know, when at Seinfeld, you know, we were using, jun you know, junior mints. Mm -hmm. And not, we weren't asking ju the Junior Mint Company if we could, you know, name their products. We were just doing it, mm -hmm. and that was supposedly something you weren't allowed to do. And right. yet, we were doing it. And once it became a huge thing, and you know, I kind of had a little bit of a hand in that because I was the first person who, and I was the person on the show who introduced, like, the thing of everybody saying Snapple to each other. Mm -hmm. you know, they just turned to each other and go Snapple. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it's so it's funny. The rules change on based on your level of success. Yeah, well, that's what I figured, right? You know, it's like society as a whole. You know, if like, you know, if you're a very very wealthy person, you have a good chance of, you know, getting away with murder. Quite literally. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, according to the way things were. You know, saying junior mints all the time and having them land in somebody's body cavity in a surgery in a surgical operating room, that should have been the equivalent of murder on TV. But you know once you got the ratings that high, then you yeah. can, you can commit murder on a nightly Absolutely. Uh, you get basis. Away. And, and, and and you did, by the way. You guys killed George's fiance. <laughs> you know, once you can do a half hour on masturbation, there are no rules left. There's no rules left. <laughs> yeah, how in the world did they allow that? Even as successful as Seinfeld was, because I think that if you had said, you know, on the Cosby Show, let's, on any of those shows, uh, that you know I grew up with in the '80s and then, then into the '90s, let's do a half an hour of masturbation. You, everybody in that building would have been fired. That was the only time when we had a table read. Where between Castle Rock and NBC, there was not one note. Really? It was like, I got nothing. That's how great that script was. That's how unbelievably great that script was. You know, I read that script. Larry gave me that script to read two days before the table read. And I just had a pretty good episode with The Virgin. Uh huh. Yeah. And um, I was feeling pretty good about myself. And then I read the contest. I walk into Larry's office. I just like plop it on his desk. I said, "Yeah, I am so depressed." And he goes, "That is the absolute best best compliment I could get." <laughs> I mean, it was so good that I was almost depressed. 
<laughs> That's how great it was. Did, did he write that one? Yes. And so when he writes one, uh, do other people chip in, polish? What do you guys do? No, but over the course of the week, you know, it was very, very casual in certain ways. You know, it, it was a very odd arrangement in a way because, you know, it was very casual. You could just wander down to the set whenever you wanted to and hang out with the actors and. I did it a lot because I'm not somebody who like sits and writes for four hours. I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. I would wander down there and, and, you know, Larry was very open to people like suggesting jokes and, or funny lines and things like that. And so, you know, that you would get little things in and, um, you know, I would always tell Larry what my favorite line in his scripts were and there were times when it was like the line that Jerry didn't particularly like, so mm -hmm. it would kind of make Larry feel kind of stronger about his opinion on things. Sure, yeah. So you know, the overall lesson I, I'm getting from this is that uh, freedom makes a huge difference. So, like, if you give people enough room to run, yeah, they might screw up, uh, but but they might also produce something great or even historic. Well, yeah, you know, it's a you know, especially back then, it's changed a lot now because you look at some of the people who are in sitcom, or not sitcom writing actually at all, but you know, some people who are in TV writing now, you know, Matt Weiner and um, you know, the guy who did The Wire and you know, all David Simon, yeah. David Simon, you know, these are incredibly talented people and it's kind of amazing that they wind up in TV now. That's how good it is. You know, I mean, not that there weren't always good TV writers, but you know, this is where it's going now. You know, back then, especially sitcom wise, you didn't get people who were quite as ambitious as Larry in a way as far as making social commentary, you know, having an impact. I mean, you know, they always called it the show about nothing, but it was a show about everything. If yeah. you look at the way things are now, you know, I mean, you know, even in our, in, in the hour department in the 90s, you know, David Milch was, on from NYPD Blue, was like five miles above everybody else in his brilliance and his writing. Mm -hmm. yep. Now there's, you know, four or five different people out there who can compete, you know, who are that good. But I think that buttresses the, the same point, which is that I, those guys get great freedom to, to do the scripts in the way that they want to and to have the, they have this enormous vision and the, the HBOs and the FXs and the AMCs are, are letting them run with that vision. I think before they were killing the creativity by the, the system you explained, notes and this and to all these cooks in the kitchen and well now it's, on those places, it's almost like they're hiring the talent as opposed to just hiring the story. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're investing in people as opposed to investing in a one-line, you know, cops, uh, cops in, on Broadway, you know. And, that, <laughs> yeah. and they, you know, they used to be, okay, great, but now it's like, no, uh, David Simon, okay, what, you want to do something? We're going to give you some, you know, we're going to give you some free rope. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one last thing about Seinfeld. Uh, at the time, did you guys uh, used to go out for drinks together and hang out, or you went in, you, you did your work, and went home? Uh, and and do you guys go out for drinks these days, or is the, has the band disbanded? Um, back then, you know, there were. Parties and things during hiatus on occasion that we'd all get together for. And, you know, after every shoot night, the writers and actors would generally go to Jerry's delicatessen and sit there till like three in the morning. You know, we'd go over our biggest regrets of the night of that week. And uh, it would be really funny and that would be really great. Um, the band has kind of, yeah, the band is, it's, the band is kind of broken up.
You know, I mean, I see Larry Charles here and there and Dave Mandel and some of these other people. And, you know, I'm sure Larry and Jerry get together once in a while. And I, I you know, but I, you know, it's not like we all get together. Yeah. Okay. It's funny. I just felt vindicated like Larry David did with his jokes when you backed him up. Uh, Jerry's Deli is still my favorite place in LA. Okay. Now they closed down a couple of them, right? Right. Uh, and everybody busts my chops over it. They're like, ah, Jerry's Deli, that's not the deli to go to. But you guys went to it. It, mu it must be the right deli. Which one uh, did you guys it's use? Studio to? City. The one in Studio City. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'd be there like really, really late. Yeah. I love that place. I used to drive home to Venice and I could never beat 23 minutes. You know, I used to like speed home, and try to beat 23 minutes, and I could never seem to do it. Okay, so speaking of time, I, I lied. One more question about Seinfeld. How long did it did you guys have to write one script? There was no set amount of time. You know, you were kind of on your. You know, it was very quietly competitive. You know, as casual as I, it was, as I mentioned, you know, you, you had to get, you had to turn out scripts and. And, you know, especially once the show is a huge success, you know, in a way you wanted to get as many shows on the air as possible because, you know, this is a windfall for your future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not just money-wise, but also, you know, for your ability to actually impact the culture. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, for me it was a bigger deal to do that. But, you know, there's no denying that every time you get your name on one of those episodes, you know, it's worth a lot of money to your, to your future. You know, it was more of a thrill for me if something caught on, you know, like, you know, if double dipping caught on, I was like, oh my God, this is so great. No, but I'm telling you, you got to wake up with a smile every day on your face because every time I go to double dip, I think of you. Okay, I didn't know it was you, right? Yeah. But I think of the episode and I go, God damn. I want to double dip, but now can I at least turn the chip around? <laughs> you know, you know, if, as a writer on the show, you have a different memory of particular episodes than what a viewer has. I, you, you name an episode that has my name on it, and I think about, did I really do a good job in that one? Did I have to be rewritten? A lot. Mm -hmm. Did it take me way too long to do it? Um, what was going on that week? You know, there are episodes that are great that I feel crappy about because I think I did a lousy job and maybe Larry and Jerry saved me. Mm -hmm. And then there are episodes I feel great about because, you know, I feel like, you know, in Yada Yada and, and the implant with Terry Hatcher, you know, I felt like I did. Yeah, you know, like really great work. So you know, some of them, some of them are really good episodes, and I just don't feel good about them. But you know, yeah. Well, let that go. Yeah, <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm giving yeah. permission right now. To I mean, you know, go. like, come, you know, coming up with the story itself. Just you know, like, I did a pretty good job on the sponge. Mm -hmm. But you know, and but you know, I'm very happy with the idea. What I really like about that one is hearing on the radio that the sponge was going out of business and immediately think if Elaine uses the sponge as her birth control device, she would try to buy out the entire west side. She would only get a limited number which would change her entire screening process for who she sleeps with. I mean, that was like one thought. And that's what you dream of, you know, that's what right. you dream of. See, I have those thoughts too, except I don't work on any show like that. Right. So well, I don't either. I don't either. <laughs> I have I have a, a million thoughts Let's lying start. around. I started doing stand up just because I have some thoughts lying around. <laughs> well, it may, maybe we'll work on something together. So, uh, but in terms of writing the script, sorry to get back to the time. So, was it a week you had? You had a month? Did it matter? Do you see what I'm saying? Um, you know, sometimes if they really needed your script to be next, you know, you'd have three days or whatever. Right. And you know, the funny thing is if you have the story figured out, if you have all the beats of the story, writing it is not hard. Writing dialogue, at least for me, is easy. It's 
it's figuring out the story that's really difficult. But once you have the whole story figured out, you knock it out. It's, it's not hard. All right, and, and then you mentioned the money there, and, and everybody's curious, I'm curious. So having worked on Seinfeld, are you set, you're done, uh, you're, you're good to go for the rest of your life? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, you can't, I, I imagine you can't get into specifics, but uh, one episode, so it's based on the episodes you wrote, right? Right. So you, you, you got a fixed salary and then, per, and then you got royalties per episode uh, once you're a staff writer or, or do I <laughs> yeah, have it no, wrong? You, you, you got paid per episode produced, mm -hmm. not that you wrote. You know, like, okay, say I'm, I'm co-producer. So for your contract is like you get paid X amount for all the shows that are produced that season. So, you know, we did 22, 24, you get X number of dollars for each of those episodes. Then you'd get paid to write. Then you'd get, you know, you, for the episodes you wrote, you would get that writing fee. And then, you know, for the repeats on the network, you get more. And it, was, it, it was just, you know, it's crazy. But whatever mm -hmm. fee you got in the beginning eventually was eclipsed significantly by the reruns. Is that right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so when they make a deal like they just did with Hulu for a gigantic amount of money. Yeah, you tell me, I don't know. <laughs> I, was I, a, I think it was $100 million. Yeah, I don't, yeah, but I don't know, you know, like when or what I'm getting off that. I oh, so you idea. haven't gotten the mail, a check in the mail yet? No. Okay. And if but, I have, I, it would be really annoying because it was only for like, you know, $1,000. So. <laughs> yeah, no, probably not. It's got to be, it's gotta be better than that. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually don't know what the Hulu deal is. Right. Okay, but so whatever it was, it was plenty, right? Yes. And so that's it. That one day that you went to go get that sandwich and ran into Larry David, uh, you know, at least financially, could have made uh, all the difference in the world for you. Possibly. Yeah. Wow. That's great, man. I got to go get more sandwiches. Um, okay. Now you wrote the book. Uh, is it now? It's a Jewish podiatrist, uh, and he's telling the story. Uh, to a guy who's been his friend who was struck by lightning and he's in the hospital bed. You're not a podiatrist, but are you the protagonist basically? No. Okay. Um, a lot of his opinions and some of his observations are mine, but no. You know, he's, uh, I, I'm very in favor of like if you're going to write fiction that you should make something up. <laughs> like the whole concept of writing what you know. Uh -huh. It just drives me crazy, and I, I don't understand why you are expected to write what you know if you're expected to write fiction. Make it up. <laughs> you know, John Updike didn't work in a Toyota dealership, and he wrote pretty damn convincingly about it. Right. Um, so, what drove you to write about the Jewish podiatrist telling his story, and this crazy thing where he throws the thing through the window? And well, I don't know. You know, I had dinner with a friend an old college friend who's out here, you know, and his parents were in town and they were telling me about a Long Island town that has become so, I hate to say, overrun with Orthodox Jews, but that's what it is, that if you own a business in that town and you are open on the Sabbath, Friday night or Saturday, you will be economically frozen out, whether you're Jewish or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way that they're foisting their views on other people was so offensive to me. And this is like in a really she she shopping area on Long Island. Mm -hmm. I was so offended by it that I don't know. I just started writing and it took on a life of its own. I, I was 35 pages in before I realized I was writing a novel, but that was the spark. That was the little spark. You're Jewish, yes. uh, uh, so you're more allowed to write that book. But was there blowback anyway? Were uh, Orthodox Jews pissed? Uh, um, a little bit, not that much, not as much as I hoped. I was hoping to. <laughs> I was I was hoping they'd be a lot more annoyed. <laughs> um, all right, all right. I, you I, know, I, it's funny. You, you say I'm Jewish, and so I'm. A, I'm it's okay for me to say right. these things, but in a way, it's worse. You know, it's in uh -huh. a way, it's worse to be Jewish and to go after Orthodox Jews. You know, like if 
you know, if James Baldwin was going after Orthodox Jews, I mean, like, oh, what does he know? Uh -huh. But, you know, with me, it's like he should know better. You know, I mean, you know, it's not like yeah. Philip Roth, but, you know, I mean, anyway. Yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, believe me, uh, I've got my share of critics, so <laughs> there's no end to it. Um, no, I was hoping for more. So, uh, you, you know, I'm always, I'm always. There's up. always next time. I'm always up for the fight. <laughs> so, uh, did you like writing? Did you enjoy the process? And how did you do it? Do you write a couple hours a day? You wrote the whole day. You know, I, what's what's your process there? Again, I, I you know, I, I don't know if I have if I have a compulsion to break every rule. But I do not write a certain amount of pages a day. I don't write at a certain time of day. My rule was to try to make a little progress every day, even if it was just a paragraph. Odds are, if you settle down, to, if you sit down to write a paragraph, you'll go beyond that. Right. But, you know, no two-hour minimum. You know, I'm not sitting in there going, okay, my coffee's done, my newspaper's done, and get me in that room and close the door, you know? I wasn't, uh, I enjoyed writing it so much, I can't tell you. It was like so free, you know. You know, when you work in TV for a while, you know, there's a lot of people around, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people reading what you do and there's a lot of people commenting. So this, at least for the amount of time it took to write the book, which is, you know, nine, ten months, you know, you're pretty much on your own and you kind of can kind of enjoy it. So I, I have some friends who've written books who say it's really hard, uh, but some of them are trying to do other things while writing the book, which I suspect is makes it much harder. Um, so if you're if you're trying to do it kind of on the side, that, that's probably pretty difficult. Uh, but they don't mind going around talking about it. Uh, did you like dislike the the doing the publicity for the book? I met a lot of cool people, not unlike yourself. <laughs> Um, I met a lot of, in, you know, I had a lot of very enjoyable conversations. I met a ton of really great people all over the country. But, you know, talking about it and everything, it feels like it's in lieu of doing it. And, you know, you're always talking and you're always kind of like trying, walking this tightrope of trying not to sound like you're selling, which I'm the worst salesperson in the world. And, you know, so, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't dislike it, but it's not my favorite part of the process. The writing was much more fun. You know, I keep thinking that, you know, with writing, it's like buying a new car. You know, you like the writing is fine and everything like that, but the second you hit send, and send your work out to the world, it's like driving a new car off the lot. It devalues by 50% immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're going to do it again? I had trouble with the analogy parts of the SATs, as you could imagine. <laughs> no, no, I got it. But you still have that new car smell, though. That's not yes. a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, well. We're going to work that into a, a plot point for Kramer. Um, so you're going to do it again? Uh, you're going to write yes, it again? Yes, I finished another one. Oh, you did already? I've already finished another one. Can you tell us what it's about or no? Yes. It's about, it's a complete departure. It's about a girl in the South. She's in high school. She's a high school senior and a track star. And she happens to know for a fact that in a previous life she was Sigmund Freud. <laughs> okay. And but wait a minute. You weren't a track star in South Carolina or Sigmund Freud. How did you write or, about that? Or a woman. <laughs> or a woman. <laughs> uh, you know, it's 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 really I'm you know I'm waiting for the police to come in. So you know what? I, so we'll end on this. That I I I think my goal at the end of all this, uh, whenever is this, piece this of, is, over, is this piece of tape on the desk here for a reason? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You're allowed to break the rules. You made a lot of money uh, breaking the rules. So go ahead and take it off. And I'll end on this thought. I, I that's what I want to do. I want to get to a point where you are, where I can sit around and write. I love writing. Um, I just don't have time to do it. And and to say, hey, you well, know what? Well, if you do the one paragraph a day thing, maybe you do have time. Oh. <laughs> you don't know my life, <laughs> but I uh, don't know your life. Yeah, uh, but I can imagine it because I write fiction. That's true. Maybe uh, maybe you write 
uh, the book I'm supposed to write, and then it all works. <laughs> um, but anyway, so as you can tell, uh, I, env I envy your life in a lot of ways. So uh, thank you for taking a slice of that life and sharing it with us here. Uh, learned a lot from it. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. It's been a total pleasure. All right. Thank Everybody you. check out the book. It won't always be this great.